We're here today at the Perkium and the Upper Perkium and Creek, uh, located in East Greenville, above Green Lane Reservoir. And our mission today is to take a closer look at stream macroinvertebrates. What we're doing here is I'm holding the net. Kim is walking downstream toward me, shuffling her feet in a left to right motion, not front to back. And as she's approaching the net, that's going to disturb the bottom, the substrate, and chase the animals, hopefully, into our net. These stone flies are such little, fast little monkeys. Hi, folks. We're here at the fly fishing area Green Lane Park. This is the Perkyoma Creek above or north of uh, Green Lane Reservoir. And we're here today to take a closer look at aquatic life in the Perkyoma Creek. We can learn a lot about water quality from the types of animals, the types and numbers of organisms that inhabit uh, the creek in question. Uh, in this case, the upper Perkyoma Creek. So we have a, a nice sampling here that we just pulled using kick nets, also known as seine nets. That's S-E-I-N-E. -E have a little fish, a little sucker of some sort, and a lot of uh, what we call macro, aquatic macroinvertebrates. Macro means you can see it without a microscope. So we're going to take a closer look at some of these little creatures. And that's a good place to start. We have, I don't know if we can get close on that, a little brush-legged mayfly here. So mayflies, the insect order Ephemoptera, uh, ephemeral meaning short-lived. Uh, these animals spend several months as nymphs in the creek in this form. Once they get wings, they live for a day or less. So their objective at that point is to find a mate, to mate, to lay eggs, and then that generation uh, dies. But these, these little creatures have a really neat way of uh, moving very quickly. People think they're fish until you look and see six legs, you know it's not a fish. Um, so these guys are herbivores, so they're plant eaters. And same for, it's another type of mayfly. It does it a little differently. This is, uh, oh, if you cooperate, very tiny, but a flat-headed mayfly. And this is a type of, oh, come on, roll over. <laughs> they look much better right side up. Not looking at their white underbellies. But you see the three-part tail, a good uh, way to remember this, a good little trick. Um, to remember what a mayfly nymph is, a three-part tail, the month of May has three letters, M-A-Y. So uh, mayfly nymphs <clears throat> always have three tails. We're going to look at uh, another type of, some other nymphs in a moment here that do not have three-part tails. But this uh, is what's known as a uh, scraper herbivore. Uh, so the rocks we see out here in the creek bottom become covered this time of year with algae, which can be very tricky for you and me to walk on because it's slippery. but it's kind of a salad bar for these little creatures, for these uh, flat-headed mayflies. Now we're moving from the herbivores up the food chain a little bit to the predators. And uh, yeah, this is not exactly <clears throat> fierce looking, this animal. This is a stonefly nymph. And I'm going to wet my hands. See a beautiful design for living in moving water. His body is flat. So it can live on the bottoms of stones or on the creek bottom, and then we get big rainfall, which sometimes happens. They don't get flushed downstream. But notice here the two part tail, not three. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, for as peaceful as this guy looks, this, this guy is a uh, voracious little predator, what we call an engulfer predator, which means he just like gobbles his food up in kind of the old fashioned way. But the two part tail, the flat body, very prehistoric looking. So the stonefly nymph. There we go. Get you back in, in the drink here. And then may, we may see this creature as an adult. This is one of our many species of damselflies. Some people call them, they've had crazy nicknames over time, like devil's darning needles. <clears throat> devil's got nothing to do with it, I'm sure. But they're often very bright metallic colors, blues or greens as adults. The one that just flitted through, I hope we see it again, has a green body and jet black wings. He's called a uh, ebony jewel wing. What a great name. But like most of our aquatic nymphs, 
very cryptically colored, like the, like the substrate, like the bottom of the creek. So yeah, no fancy colors here. As adults, when you have wings, you can afford to be uh, a little showy. As a nymph, not so much. So you've probably seen damselflies in a trick as they're related closely to, to uh, dragonflies, and that's the order Odonata. But a dragonfly, when she comes to rest, has her wings out to the sides. A damselfly, this is hard to do, as I'm getting older, folds hers over her back, ow. Um, so that's a pretty uh, hard and fast rule in most cases to tell a damsel from a dragonfly. And this, well, this guy might reach out and touch me, but this is my favorite aquatic macroinvertebrate, known as a Dobsonfly larva or a Helgramite. And these are legendary uh, among fishermen, especially people who fish for smallmouth bass as a source of bait for fishing. And uh, look at those jaws go, man, he, he could do a number on me. But again, you see something really cool design-wise. I want to keep them alive here. You see a very flat body profile. So again, this thing will not wash away during heavy rain events, and that, that's a beautiful thing. It has another trick. I might need a volunteer for this. The jaws are what can hurt you, and that's how they uh, engulf or devour their prey. And, and they'll eat things, uh, including minnows. I mean, they, they get larger than this, so they would get the length of my, probably about my middle finger there, and almost the same in girth. But what happens here, Kim, can you lend me a finger? This is going to do something interesting. It's not going to hurt. What's it doing? Yeah, it's grabbing on. So it's got these little grapple hooks in the back. What a beautiful thing. So it's not last, latching on to park employees or even third graders in the creek. It's latching on to the bottoms of these large stones, cobbles and boulders and so on. So again, with that flat body, he can just hang out there all day. When something comes by that looks tasty, he can just get out there and uh, gobble it up. So our Dobson fly larva or Helgramite. So we're gonna put him back in the drink. And they have a really neat way of uh, wiggling their, undulating their body, the way they move. It's pretty wild, kind of in a backwards fashion, kind of like a crayfish does. We don't have a crayfish today, sadly. And then if they feel threatened, they'll, they'll sometimes roll up into a ball, kind of like armadillo style, for lack of a better term. And we're going to put these creatures back in the pan, and very shortly they'll be going back into Perkyoman Creek. So we mentioned water quality earlier. Something we can do with these animals is all aquatic macroinvertebrates have a classification, class one, two, or three. Now the definitions change slightly or, or the, uh, the, the, ver the verbiage over time. I'm kind of old school, so we'll do it that way. The class ones are sensitives. So these are animals that are sensitive to pollution in, in, the, uh, in the environment. So you want to find a lot of class one organisms. We just met a few of them the Dobson fly larva, the mayfly nymphs, both of them, and the stonefly nymph. Those are all examples of class one organisms. So if there's, the water's polluted to uh, any extent, you're likely not to find them. Now we have class two organisms known as somewhat sensitive. Uh, I'm going back to my old school ways. Facultative was the old fashioned word for that. So they're not terribly sensitive, nor terribly tolerant of pollution. So examples of that would be uh, crayfish. We all know them. The damselfly nymph that we looked at, she would be an example of that. And I'm looking for one more little flat-bodied little beauty here. And it'll take me a moment. They love to stick to rocks and eventually stick to me. Notice the round shape and the copper color. That's known as a water penny. How nice. I don't know if they're used as currency anywhere, but you see it's moving. If you have about half an hour, it will go somewhere very slowly, kind of a snail's pace, or in this case, a water penny's pace. But oddly enough, this is actually the larva of a beetle, so it won't look like this its, it's whole life. This, this, that, that's a land speed record for this, for this species. I've never seen it move that fast. So that, again, the flat body design, and uh, these are... Uh, scraper herbivores, we call them. So again, like the, the uh, flat-headed mayflies and like snails, they kind of literally scrape the algae off these, uh, these submerged stones here. So it's a pretty, pretty neat trick. And I, I can only think of one other creature that was in here that surprises people. 
to find in a freshwater environment sometimes. A lot of our students are surprised to find them here. Oh, here we go. These are wee little guys. These are tiny little freshwater clams. And we sometimes find a lot of these. So these would be an example of a uh, somewhat tolerant, so a class two organism. We don't have any, any class threes, also known as tolerance today. So uh, pouch snails would be an example of that. Leeches, and people get creeped out by leeches. So maybe it's a good thing uh, for the viewers that we don't have a leech here. Um, but it is kind of fun to uh, let them stick to your body. Well, for people like me it is anyway. But we don't have one to do show and tell with a leech today, so uh, sorry about that. So when we do uh, classify these organisms, we do this, this activity with our students, uh, we can do what's known as a biotic index. So water qualities, depending on the scale you use, range from poor to fair to good to very good. We're consistently in that good to very good range here in the upper Perkiomen. Uh, that, of course, would change if you went, took the Perkiomen downstream, like down Schwanksville, more toward Collegeville. More humans is going to mean more interference, you know, more pollutants in the, in the system. And so uh, the water quality, as you go downstream in a, a given watershed, it's, the water t t uh, quality is going to tend to uh, diminish somewhat. So some exciting news uh, about water quality. Just up above the bridge, I don't know if you can get that shot from here, there's what we call a low head dam that's been there since probably the 40s or 50s. That is slated for removal uh, this August and that's going to do wonders for the water quality here. It's, it's wonderful now, it's going to get a whole lot better because there's all the silt building up behind that low head dam. And they're very old school and kind of antiquated and uh, just not terribly good for water quality and, and we're all concerned with that nowadays. People are becoming, finding that more of a, a value to aspire to. So yeah, that'll be coming out in August and that's the plan and uh, so by next spring, the diversity is going to be even greater in this uh, upper Perkiomen Creek watershed. So as promised, we're finished with these creatures, examining them. We're going to release them now. Important thing is to face upstream into the current. And I'm not going to dump the animals from warm to cold water. I'm going to very carefully and deliberately submerse the pan and let the cold and warm wa warmer water mix and uh, release all the animals unharmed back into, into the stream. And it's important that the, to check your pan or your pail or whatever at the end because a lot of these little creatures that could stick onto rocks will stick to the bottom of your pan. And uh, they don't necessarily know what's good for them, so we want to make sure with our fingers to get everybody out and back into the creek.